Okay, you guys, we're getting close to the end here. We have three more lectures, basically, right? We have, I think, the second intertidal lecture today, and then tomorrow we're going to talk about kelp forests and coral reefs and stuff, right? But first, let's get through this one, right? This is probably, like, my favorite one of all of them, okay? Um, maybe even more so than the crab lecture. But it's just because I grew up with the titles, right? And I've been to the titles all my life, and I like looking for sea animals and picking them up and taking pictures of them in my hand. Right, that's what I usually do. I'll show you some pictures at the end, but first let's get into this. Let's do a quick recap of the intertidal lecture we talked about yesterday, a short one in which I described the intertidal zone. Okay, for example, the zone that is experiencing tides throughout the day. Right? What causes tides again? <laughs> Yeah, so gravity from the moon, and to a lesser extent, the sun, right? When the sun and moon are aligned, then you get a spring tide in which the, the high tide's really high and the low tide's really low, okay? All right, so now we know what the intertidal zone is. There are several challenges in the intertidal zone. So for example, during high tide, what is there? Like what's going on during high tide that's a challenge for these intertidal organisms? Yeah, so you got big waves, right, crashing on the rocks with these tiny little animals living there, right? For the ones that can move, they just hide, right? That's okay. But for the ones that cannot move, they just have to take it head on. So how are they able to take it head on? <laughs> okay. What else? More importantly, their foot is tightly suctioning into the rock. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, limpets have a strong suctioning foot that sticks into the rock. Two feet of the sea star, right? The sea star uses them to suction onto the rock. What else? Hiding. What was that? Hiding. Hiding? Yeah, hiding for multi-organisms, but what about the sessile? Yeah, so kind of, right? Cement, right? Cement by the barnacles attaches them to the rock so it stays there. And what about the mussel? Thread. Yeah, the muscle has those threads, right? The bristle threads. Okay? So that's how you would survive the wave action. Okay? But then as I later described, it turns out high tide was a good thing for these animals, right? Because high tide brings in new water, and with new water, what can you do? You can get oxygen. You can get oxygen, and what else? Well, what do you mean by that? Like, what activity is it? Yeah, they get food, exactly. Okay, so you can eat. If you are in the air, you are not able to filter feed, right? And also, because most of the animals, if they move around too much, they will lose the water that they're holding. They also can't graze if there's no water, right? So by having the high tide bringing all the water in, then they can move around and eat or they can do filter feed. Okay, so high tide is actually good and low tide is bad, right? Because sea animals don't like being dry. Right. What's it called when they dry out? Desiccation. Make sure you know how to spell it with two C's. Right. Okay, so how do you combat desiccation? Give me an example. Oh, actually, you know, I'll, I'll give you an organ that you tell me what it does. Um, the limpet. What's the limpet? the water in the kelp. By doing what? It like sucks onto the rock. Yeah, it suctions onto the rock so it holds the water between the shell and the rock, right? Mm -hmm. What about the mussel? Yeah, so it has two shells, and the water can be held inside the shell, right? Mm -hmm. What about the sea anemone? Withdraw the yeah, they withdraw the tentacles to reduce surface area so that it doesn't evaporate as fast, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what about snails, the behavioral adaptation? Seven, seven, or door, no, the door. behavioral adaptation. Oh. Yeah, not the physical one. They group together. Yeah, they group together, right? And where do they group together? in crevices where there's more water retention, okay? And then crabs, where do they hold their water? Inside the shell, right? Why is the crab shell more convenient than like the snail's shell and stuff? It can move around even though it's holding the water, right? Whereas the snail can't, if it starts moving around, the water will leak out. Okay, so if the crab can move around during low tide, then what can it do? Eat, exactly. Okay, so that's a little advantage of the crab during low tide. But during high tide, it usually has to hide because it will get swept off because it's not stuck to the rock. Okay? All right, cool. So today we're going to get into a new topic called ecology, right? Like ecology is a branch of biology. There's like tons of different branches of biology, but this one deals with interactions between 
organism versus other organisms or organisms versus their ecosystem or their environment. Okay, so the interactions between, when we talked about food webs, that was actually ecology. Okay, and we're gonna see there's gonna be a lot of different types of trophic interactions when we look at ecology because that's probably the main way things interact in the wild. Something eats something else, right? That's probably the most common interspecies interaction, right? Getting eaten or eating something else. Okay, so let's talk about this. The first thing we need to talk about when we talk about ecology, though, is something called a niche, all right? This is a kind of obscure concept that people like to describe as an ecological role, but I don't really like this definition because it kind of misleads you. It makes it feel like it has to be done, whereas that's not really the case. A niche is just an activity, all right? That's how I like to describe it. It's an activity that can be done. So if it can be done, then something will do it, okay? It's not something that has to be done, right? You make it seem like a role, like that's your role, you have to do it. No, that's not true. That's a job, you can do it or not. But then everybody's just like, oh yeah, one of us will do it for sure, because for every niche, there is something to be gained. Okay, whether that be food, shelter, or another survival need, right? There's something to be gained, and as long as there's something to be gained, then there will be an organism out there who will toughen up and go take that niche, no matter how hard it is. Okay, so as long as there's something to be gained, something will do that niche. It just so happens that sometimes these niches have side effects that benefit other organisms. So then we kind of make it seem like it's a role. That's your job. If you do that, everyone else will benefit. But it's not like they care. It's a side effect. Okay, so let's talk about different types of niches, right? Here's an example. Eating all the dead stuff before bacteria gets to it. What, what was the name of this niche? Scavenging. Scavenging. Do you guys remember that like, if you don't eat the dead stuff, then the bacteria gets to it, and then when the bacteria gets to it, it'll take all the oxygen out of the water, and then now all the fish will die because it becomes anoxic, right? So this is a pretty important niche, okay? But at the same time, realize that all the scavengers are not doing it to retain oxygen in the water. They're doing it because it's free food. Does that make sense, right? This free food that's easily obtainable, it won't fight, it won't run away, it's dead, right? It's right there. <clears throat> okay, here's another one. Controlling a population of rabbits before they eat everything. Another useful niche, right? Something that maybe like a wolf would do. Um, if you don't do this, the rabbits will overpopulate and they'll eat everything. Since eating rabbits is an activity, then something will evolve the traits necessary to catch and eat a rabbit, okay? Is there something to be gained? Yes, food, right? So someone will try to do it. <clears throat> okay, decomposing dead things to return nutrients back to the ground. So like a mushroom or a fungus, decomposers like that, insects do this, right? They're not trying to return the nutrients back to the ground. They're just doing this because by doing the decom decomposition, they get food and nutrients out of it, okay? What else? Making oxygen for us to breathe. Who does this one? Plants, right? This is a really important niche that all plants do, okay? And keep in mind, they're not making oxygen for us. They're making an oxygen as a waste product because they're trying to do photosynthesis, right? They're trying to get food. There's something to be gained out of doing photosynthesis, so they will do it. It just happens to do this as well, right? So now I'm gonna give you one that's not readily apparent. There's a benefit to other organisms, right? Flying through the air, like a bird, okay? A bird can fly through the air. This is considered a niche because it is an activity, right? Is there something to be gained? Yes, shelter, right? And being able to reach higher places and more food. But it does not directly benefit that many other organisms, right? It's a very obscure niche, but you just realize that it's an activity that has something to be gained. So if that's the case, there will be an organism that will rise up to it and do it because they want to gain whatever it is to gain. Okay, they, all they have to do is gain the necessary adaptations and they will go do it. All right, so let's talk about that last one, okay? So the bird, the bird flying doesn't really help that many other organisms. So this kind of seems like a selfish niche, but keep in mind, none of those niches are selfless, all right? None of those organisms take up those niches because they're trying to help someone. They're all neutral. Right, they're all just trying to gain something and there's some sort of side effect, or in this case, there's no side effect, right? Well, I mean, sometimes there's a side effect, right? You might 
carry seeds to another location, but that's sometimes, right? Um, for the most part, a bird is just flying up a tree and all it's doing is just getting to a higher place, right? The bird realizes that no land animal is taking up all this three-dimensional air, and so it will grow wings to take up that space. Nobody else is doing it, right? Look at all that stuff. If you can get up there, you can get away from any predator, right? So it's a pretty uh, valuable activity to be able to do. <clears throat> so that, that's the main concept I'm trying to get across, right? These organisms are not taking their niche because they want to help others. They are taking it because there's something to be gained and whatever else happens is a side effect, okay? So the plants are not trying to help us. They are doing their own thing, okay? That's what a niche is. And we should be thinking about niches when we cover all the different zones in the intertidal zone, which we'll get into in a second. Right, any questions about niches? Okay, so in the human world, we can compare niches to like jobs and stuff. All right, jobs, because a job is an activity and there's something to be gained, money, right? There's a financial incentive for people to take on jobs. In the natural world, these are the incentives, right? Food, water, and shelter. If you can gain these things, then there will be an organism that will be compelled to take up a niche and all it has to do is evolve the necessary adaptations and it will go do it, right? To gain those things, okay? So like in the human world, you just gotta think, <clears throat> there's a bunch of jobs out there. Some of them pay a lot, some of them pay a little. Now, why would anybody in the right mind choose the jobs that pay a little, all right? Well, it's not like they're dumb or anything. It's more like they're just trying to take advantage of the fact that there's something to be gained there, right? If you don't do it, someone else is going to be not greedy enough to go do that job, right? Um, someone, if you're not gonna do it, someone else is gonna do it. Because they see, when they see a job, they see free money, free money on the table. And so they're gonna go do it, right? Every job will eventually get filled, okay? So same with nature, right? As long as there's free water and food and shelter lying somewhere, someone will rise up to the challenge of trying to get that. And they will take up the niche necessary to go get that. All right, cool. So let's continue on, right? Um, this side of survival and reproduction, right? If anything benefits these two things, then the organism will go take up a niche. <clears throat> All right, cool. So um, just remember this line, and we will talk about the different zones in the intertidal zone. Think about each zone as being a niche. All right. All right. So let's talk about the intertidal zone. Intertidal zone from here to here. Right, the zone where water meets land and experiences tides. Okay? Any higher does not experience tides, any lower does not experience tides. The intertidal zone can be split into any number of three to five zones, depending on which book you're reading, but we're going to go split it up into four zones. Okay? So for this class, we're going to go over four zones and we'll name them off starting from the bottom. Okay? Bottom and we're going to go all the way up. Okay, so the bottommost zone is called the subtidal zone. Looking at its name, you can tell it is below the main intertidal zone. Right? The subtidal zone is the lowest zone, and in consequence, it has the most amount of water. Does that make sense? Right? It's the lowest zone, it's the closest to the ocean, so therefore it has the most amount of water. Right? It is always submerged. That's the rule of the subtidal zone. It's always submerged. So Organisms that live in the subtidal zone have constant access to water. They are not as afraid of low tide as other organisms are because they will have access to that water, right? They don't have to fear desiccation as much. So if that's the case, then they don't really experience intertidal conditions, but at the same time, they're kind of spoiled, right? They're kind of spoiled because they prefer the nice conditions. A lot of food, oxygen, and temperature is at stable levels, right? So they're kind of spoiled, and whenever you get a spoiled person or a spoiled organism, they're weak, right? They are not very tolerant of any bad things like desiccation. They don't have to be, though, because they always have water. Does that make sense? So, in, like, if you want to think of the subtitle zone as a whole, here you have a zone in the intertidal zone that always has water. You don't have to be strong to live there, so 
you can think of the subtitle zone as being the easiest zone to live in, right? It's the easiest. If it's the easiest, do you think there's a lot of organisms trying to live here or a little bit? A lot. Everybody wants the easy life, okay? So since everybody tries to live in the easy zone, then one consequence that we're going to see later is there's actually more competition down here, all right? And competition is something we'll get into. It's different organisms trying to, all trying to get resources, not everybody wins, right? <clears throat> okay, so the subtitle zone has a lot of organisms. They're all trying to live in the easy environment. They're not very, they're not super strong or tolerant of desiccation because they don't have to be. It's always submerged. Okay, so um, let's take a look at some of the examples of organisms that live in the subtitle zone, all right? Oops. Uh, I guess that was just a little tidbit. I'll mention that in a second. All right, so here are some of the animals that you can find in the subtitle zone um, in California, right? So let's go through these and do maybe on a quick phylum check, right? Phylum and class check, starting from here. Mollusca, what class? Cephalopoda. Cephalopoda, good, all right. Cordata. Cordata, class? Osteichthyes, very good. Bony fish, right? Right there. Not a Nigerian. Echinodermata in class. Asteroidea, very good. Okay. Arthropoda, right? We don't know the class. Black sea hare. Um, those are eye stalks. Mollusca, yeah. In class. Gastropoda. So it's a type of slug, right? Okay, and so is this. The San Diego Dort is a type of nudibranch, so therefore also Mollusca class gastropoda. Continue on. Catch that calorie. I can't figure that out. That's a calcareous shell. Phylum Mollusca class gastropoda. How do you know it's not a bivalvia? Doesn't have two shells, all right? Not too hard to figure it out. It's not a spiral shell like a snail, but it is still a gastropod. Okay. Giant keyhole limpet. Phylum mollusca, class. Gastropoda. Gastropoda. Okay, so remember, limpets are flat cone shaped snails, okay? And this is one of them. And the last one, let's see it. Echinodermata. Echinoidea, okay? So remember, they kind of mean spiny, so this one kind of sounds the same for both of them. Okay, good, so we got this, right? See, these are some of the organisms we can find in the subtitle zone. We have organisms of all sorts of different phyla, right? Echinoderms, mollusks, arthropods, chordata, right? Chordata is gonna be hard to find in the intertidal zone because the intertidal zone is kind of a rough environment and fish like water, right? So if we find fish at all, it makes sense that we find it so low. Right. Okay, so here's what I think about um, subtitle organisms. If you find a lot of subtitle organisms at a tide pool, then I would say that's a good indication that you're at a very good tide pool. Right? Otherwise, you're at a very boring tide pool in which you just see the normal hardy organisms. When in reality, you want to see the kelp forest organisms that wandered a little bit too high, right? Because normally you would have to go dive to see these organisms, but if you're lucky enough and you're at a really good tide pool, and you'll be able to see some subtitle organisms, right? I've been through tide pools all throughout California, and I know where pretty much most of the good and the bad ones are, and I have a pretty good sense of, you know, the organisms that you can find in California. In 2013, I went to Oregon, and I was, you know, I asked some of my friends who lived there before, and they told me about four different tide pools. It's called the Boiler Bay, Seal Beach, Strawberry Fields, Strawberry Hill, yeah, Strawberry Hill, and there's one more, the Aquina Head. Yeah, and guess what? All four of them were better than every single tide pool in California. It was insane, and it was pretty amazing. They had so many subtitle organisms just out there because the water was colder, and they couldn't tell the difference between shallow and deep water, right? In California, the shallow water is warmer, so they're not going to go there, right? And so when I'm in California, I find these very, very rarely in the tide pools. And then when I learned how to scuba dive in 2010, I went down and like, there's hundreds of these. It was kind of like cheating, right? They were all down there. They just don't come up to the tide pools. 
So if you find them in typo, it's even more novel, right? Okay, so subtitle organisms, right? Use this as a gauge to tell how good a type is. Okay, so let's go up one level and talk about the low intertidal zone, right? The lower intertidal zone. There's two intertidal zones, lower and upper. The one lower is gonna be slightly lower and therefore has more water than the higher one, but it has less water than the subtitle zone, right? This is a zone that's usually submerged, but it does manage to be dry sometimes, such as during, what kind of tides have the lowest tides? Spring tides. Spring tides, right? <laughs> during spring tides, it may be dry. So this one is almost always submerged, but it's not always. Therefore, if you wanna live here, you have to be able to withstand desiccation just a little bit. Does that make sense? Because they actually encounter it. If you live in the subtitle zone, you don't really need to worry about desiccation because you pretty much never encounter it unless it's unusually dry, right? But these guys, they actually encounter it sometimes, so they have to be able to withstand desiccation just a little bit, right? Not too much, but at least a little. Those protists that you find in that little pond out there, Right now, they are facing desiccation, I think. Because remember, I told you, the second time I went there to pick up the sample, it was almost completely dry. Yet, when we put it under the microscope, they were still alive. The nematode was still alive, right? <clears throat> okay, so those ones are tolerant to desiccation. And here we have typhal organisms also resistant to desiccation. Okay, just a little bit, right? Not too much. Um, they only need it for a couple times a month but it's good to have that ability, okay? <clears throat> okay, so here are some of the examples of organisms we might find in the lower intertidal. I would say this is probably what an average tide pool has if you look hard enough, okay? So let's go through here and do a quick little phylum check. Okay, what phylum is this guy? <laughs> Arthropoda, mollusca. mollusca, and its class? Gastropoda. Arthropoda, Arthropoda. Arthropoda. good. Arthropoda. Arthropoda. Chordata, your class? Osteichthys. Cnidaria. Class, Anthozoa. Mollusca, any class? Gastropoda, very good. And phylum echinodermata class Asteroidea. Okay, good. So yeah, make sure we are staying sharp on our phyla and classes. Okay, as we see them here, there's a lot of different organisms and we can recognize most of them because we've already done some studying on all the different taxonomic levels. Okay, so what do we got here? We have um, some, uh, some new ones, right? Nigerians, we have one chordate and, and echinoderm, but for the most part, looks like Arthropods and mollusks, right? We're gonna see arthropods and mollusks are gonna start to dominate soon, right? They're dominating because they're very hardy, right? And one thing that makes them hardy is what do they have in common that these ones don't have? What do these have in common that those don't have? They have a shell, right? They have a hard calcareous shell that maybe enables you to hold water inside, right? So it makes them more tolerant to desiccation. So let's go up one level and see what organisms live there. The upper intertidal zone, like I mentioned earlier, this one is drier than the lower intertidal because it's higher up. And this one is, I'd say, the true intertidal zone because it is dry in every low tide, it is wet in every high tide pretty much, and as such, these ones actually experience the dry, wet, dry, wet every day and they have to be fully adapted to this intertidal lifestyle. Okay, so they have to be ready. They have to be able to tolerate waves. They have to be able to tolerate desiccation. Right? They're fully adapted to intertidal life. So we're here in the third highest, third lowest zone, or second highest zone, okay? We're subtitle, lower intertidal, upper intertidal, and by now, we're talking about a zone that is dry during low tide and wet during high tide. Let's see what organisms live here. 
right? What do we have? Barnacles, limpets, mussels, crabs, right? Let's do a little quick phylum check. Who's named barnacle? Arthropoda. Barnacle is arthropoda. Okay, aggregating anemone? Cnidaria. And class? Anthozoa. Mollusca, class? Gastropoda? Phylum mollusca, but the class we didn't talk about. Muscle? Phylum mollusca, class? Bivalvia. And the striped shore crab is arthropoda, right? Okay, so here are some of the organisms. What do we have here? We have one Nidarian still, but look at the rest of them. Who's dominating now, right? We have crabs, barnacles, arthropods, and mollusks, right? Arthropods and mollusks beginning to dominate the higher zones because they might be able to hold water in the shell better. So that brings us to this question right here. Do you guys notice anything, any changes in biodiversity as we're moving up? Biodiversity is the number of species in an area. What do we notice? The amount of biodiversity decreases as you go up the intertidal zone, right? Why? Because the intertidal zone, if you go up higher and higher, it becomes more and more difficult to live there. Why is it harder to live there? less water, right? Less and less water as you go up, harder and harder lifestyles. Nobody wants the hard lifestyle. Maybe nobody is able to take on the hard lifestyle, so it drops, right? The amount of organisms willing to go there or even physically able to go there goes down. Okay, so now let's continue to the last zone, right? The uppermost zone is called the spray zone, also known as the splash zone, right? Why is it called that? It's because it's always dry it will never get submerged. It will get some splashes during high tide, okay? So it's never submerged, but the high tide water splashes onto it when it re kind of reaches it, okay? So it never is covered by the water, but the water splashes onto it. So you can see this place is pretty dry. It's like borderline terrestrial at this point. Right? There's not that much water there. So you'd have to be really, really hardy to live here. It's extremely harsh. There's not that much water, there's no oxygen if you have gills, pretty much, but if you can breathe air, then good, right? Then you actually have a lot of oxygen. And it's also the warmest because there's less water to keep you cool. If you want to live here, you have to be very, very tolerant to desiccation. Okay. Right, so we have to be very, very tolerant to desiccation if we want to live here and that's, uh, that's kind of like a, a tough thing to ask for, right? It's a, kind of a lot to ask for for these small little organisms. So as such, not that many organisms are, are willing to rise up to the challenges, and the only ones that do so are these. Biodiversity is very low here, not that many different organisms. A couple barnacles, those are arthropods, and a couple different types of mollusks right here. All these guys have shells, and they're very good at holding water inside their shells. Okay. okay, so that's our discussion on the zones. Any questions on the zones? Everybody gets it? So we're gonna talk about these four zones the lowest zone has the most water, it's the easiest place to live, everybody wants to live there, and the highest zone has the least amount of water, it's difficult to live here, and not that many organisms want to live here, only these ones. Okay, the very hardy ones with shells that can hold water in the sun. <clears throat> okay, so those are the zones, and now we're gonna talk about the first reason why organisms separate themselves into zones. Notice how there's not that much overlap most organisms are found within their zone and not the other zones. Does that make sense? Right? At every of the four zones, I put different organisms up here because those organisms are found in their zone and not the other zones. Right? So you can actually see a clear distinction. There's these animals here, they're not here, they have other animals here, they're not here, they have other animals here. Right? Every organism lives in their own zones, and the first reason of which is due to 
different animals live in different zones because of their tolerance levels, right? Their tolerance levels becomes an upper limit to where they're allowed to live in the intertidal zone. Okay, that is the first of three reasons. We're gonna cover all three of them by the end of this lecture, um, but this is the first one, okay? So tolerance level. So now, in order to talk about the other reasons why zonation occurs, we're going to have to go through some very famous uh, scientific experiments that were conducted in the early 20th century. Right? So now let's talk about a species interaction, namely the one between the blue mussel and the okra sea star, or you can also call it the disaster sea star, or the purple sea star. Okay, what is the relationship between these two organisms? Sea star eats the mussel. Sea star eats the mussel. Okay, so the sea star eats the mussel. That is normally what's supposed to happen. Okay, and in the 60s and the 70s, there was a scientist named Robert Payne. Okay, and Robert Payne studied the interaction with these, and he wanted to see what would happen if I took all the sea stars out of the tide pool in this one area. Okay, so what he did was he set up two experimental plots, right? Here's one tide pool, here's another tide pool. They both have roughly the same assemblage, right? Community assemblage of mussels versus sea stars, okay? But he made one of them his control site and the other one his treatment site. Okay, the control site, you don't do anything there. And at the treatment site, you are gonna remove sea stars, right? So let's just say this is his uh, control and this is his treatment. Okay, so in his treatment, he's going to remove sea stars from those sites, and there he is collecting all the sea stars, right? Okay, collecting all the sea stars, and uh, got rid of them, okay? So, this place is has experiencing a loss of sea stars, the predator of the mussels. What do you think is going to happen now? The mussel population will increase. What do you guys think? Is that a logical conclusion? Mm -hmm. These guys are not getting eaten anymore, so they're no longer bound by the amount of sea stars. They will start to multiply in population, and their population will, in fact, explode. Okay, When a population explodes because you got rid of the predator, then we call it prey release. Right? Prey release is a scenario in which you take away a natural predator, and all of a sudden, you are no longer limited by that predator and your population will go up, okay? So, like when humans invented all their, these weapons and stopped being afraid of lions and stuff, then we made our own prey release, right? When we invented medicine, we made our own prey release against the diseases and stuff, right? Okay, and our population increased. So that's what's happening over here, right? These muscles have, you know, been relinquished from their sea star control right and now they're free to go okay now there's a lot of muscles what do you guys think bad or good depends right if we're talking about the muscle it's good right the muscles are happy but if we're talking about the tide pool health as a whole it may not be so good as we'll see later okay so at this point there's a lot of muscles in his treatment site what happens, right? What happens when the mussels explode in population? At this point, you have to realize that mussels are a sessile organism. You guys remember what that means? It means that they live in one place their whole life. But here's the thing. Sessile organisms take up space. They live on that part of the rock. So here's the way I like to describe it. When a mussel lives at point A, no other organisms can live at point A. They take up that spot, and that spot is now taken. Okay, so sessile organisms take up space. Think about that. What's gonna happen to all the other sessile organisms in the area as well? They're all hoping to get a piece of that space, right? But now there's a lot of muscles. So if we wanna talk about what's gonna happen to all the other organisms, then we need to understand competition, right? So let me just define competition real quick. Competition is a species interaction between two or more organisms in which none of them benefit from the existence of one of them, right? They all suffer 
So like, let's just say two people are competing for like a piece of the food, right? Well, since they compete, now each of them only gets half, right? The existence of one of the people, one of the, one of the people basically makes it so that the other person gets less food. If one of the people does not exist, one person gets the whole piece of food, right? So they both suffer, right? That's what competition means, okay? And it's, in general, it's like, it's kind of like a tax. It's not a good thing, right? Um, these organisms, they compete because they're all trying to go for the same thing, and the existence of all of them at the same time means that everybody gets less, okay? So that's kind of like the downfall of teamwork, right? Everybody thinks that teamwork is good because you accomplish more, but everybody gets less reward too, right? So competition will occur for these things, right? These are the main things, and the funny thing is, can you notice any similarities? Food, shelter, those are the same driving forces that cause organisms to take up what? Niche. A niche, exactly, okay? So when multiple organisms are trying to take the same niche, they will compete in that niche. Does that make sense? Right? So all the organisms that live inside the subtitle zone are competing to live in the subtitle zone for the right to live there. Okay? Because they all want that water. Does that make sense? Okay, so those are the main things that things compete for. This is not a survival thing, this is more a reproductive thing and something that males compete for. But we are missing one. Sessile organisms. Sessile organisms compete for something else, space, right? This brings us into the realm of something called spatial competition. Sessile organisms, since they occupy one spot and no one else can occupy that spot, then if you choose a good spot, too bad for everyone else, they don't get that good spot anymore. So there's spatial competition here, and there you go. Sessile organisms, they compete for space, right? They will all want the best space, and it really depends on your decision during larval settlement, right? If you choose a bad spot during larval settlement, then that's the rest of your life right there, right? But if you choose a good spot during larval settlement, then you're really lucky because everybody else was also trying to choose that good spot. <clears throat> okay, so spatial competition. Let's see how that affects the tide pools. So let's look at these. These are barnacles and barnacles are sessile. Therefore, they compete for space, right? So when barnacles compete for space, the reason why they do so is they're all trying to get food via filter feeding, all right? So let me just draw it on the board real quick. If you had a couple barnacles here, right? How do barnacles eat again? We saw the little video yesterday. They stick out, not their stomach, no, that's a sea star. Their legs, yeah. Remember, they stick out their legs like this. Remember that? And they're trying to do what? Filter feeding. So this barnacle filter feeds this little area around it, right? And this one is trying to filter that one. And this one's trying to filter that one. See how there's a little bit of overlap there? That little overlap means that because this one lives here and these two live around it, he gets less. Okay? And these get less too, because ideally they want the whole little bubble to themselves, but they have to share it. Competition like, reduces the share that everybody gets. Okay? And so, in order to avoid this competition, one of the barnacles is going to try to do something else. It's going to, maybe the one in the middle is going to try to grow taller than the other ones, so that it gets its little bubble right over here. Okay? It gets to eat the plankton before these guys get the plankton. Do you see that? But these guys are not happy about that. So what are they gonna do? They're gonna grow tall at the same time, right? All of them are trying to keep growing tall. Whoever's the tallest one gets the most food, all right? So because of the spatial competition, it induces a vertical growth like this, right? If we look at these barnacles, see how old they're actually really tall. I've never observed this in California before, but when I went to Oregon the week before this class started, I actually saw this for real, so that was cool. I thought this was like a European thing, but I guess it occurs here too. So that's pretty cool, right? Barnacles all growing tall because they're all trying to get the water before everyone else does, right? And then this is, this ends up everyone breaking even again and not winning, okay?
And it's kind of like advertising, right? If you advertise, you have to pay for it. But if you don't advertise and someone else does, then they get more revenue than you do. But so then you have to advertise as well. So now everybody advertises and wastes money in advertisement, and everybody loses revenue because they have to take away the advertisement money, right? So everybody loses when competition happens, right? And then at the end, they're still all on a level playing field, right? So it's about breaking even rather than winning, right? <clears throat> okay, so that's what happens when barnacles compete with each other. They are going to grow in height. Okay, now let's talk about interspecific competition. What happens when different species of barnacles are competing? Okay, you guys can read these ones later. This is just a comparison with trees, right? I just put this in there. Trees all try to grow tall to get the sunlight. If you don't grow tall, then someone else will grow taller and shade you. And then if you're in the shade of another tree, then you will not be able to do photosynthesis. Okay, so they all grow the same height, really tall. Okay, you guys can check that out later. So let's talk about the competition between two different species of barnacles, right? The first one's called the Damalus barnacle, the other one's called the Balanus barnacle. I promise you guys there's easier names to memorize, so um, I'll get into that in a second. This is a study done by a second scientist named Dr. Connell. Okay, so don't get those confused, right? Dr. Payne studies sea stars versus mussels. Dr. Connell studied these two barnacles. Okay, so another type tool scientist studying competition between two different species of barnacles. If we want to see how this pans out, then let's look at their stats, right? Okay, so let's take a look at their stats. We have the two different barnacles. This one's called the buckshot barnacle, and this one is called the acorn barnacle. Um, for you guys, you can use whatever name you want. You can use a scientific name, or you can use a common name, or um, you can just say the little barnacle on the big barnacle. Right, I don't mind because it's the intro class, right? So if you want to call it the little barnacle, that's okay, but I'm going to refer to it as the buckshot barnacle and the big barnacle, we'll call it the acorn barnacle, right? You can tell the difference because of the shape of the operculum, right? This is a shape like a rhombus or a diamond. This one's more elliptical, circular. Okay, so one of them's smaller and one of them's bigger. What does that mean? The smaller one is smaller and weaker than the big one, but it is extremely resistant to desiccation. Is this a good or bad trait? That is a good trait, right? Okay, so those are the stats of the smaller barnacle. Now the big barnacle is a lot bigger, therefore it will outgrow, crowd out the smaller barnacles. In direct one-on-one -on -one competition, the big barnacle always wins, okay? So this one is a stronger competitor than Okay, so what I mean by outgrow, crowd out, or smother, right? Outgrow means it grows bigger, and if it grows bigger, then imagine if this one in the middle is actually an acorn barnacle, right? Let's just say this one in the middle right here is actually an acorn barnacle. The acorn barnacle is going to be able to grow bigger than these ones. So when it grows bigger, it not only grows taller, but also wider, right? So it'll grow this wide, and then what happens when it grows even more wide? It'll just push these ones off. You see what's happening? It'll just push them off the rock, and those ones, they just die, right? So these bigger barnacles will crowd them out, right? Just by growing, okay? Just like think of a really obese person on the train. Right, taking up more space, okay, and they're crowding people off to the side. Um, <clears throat> smothering, right? What does that mean? This barnacle might grow on top of this one, and now he can't breathe or get food, so that's right, smothering. Okay, so the big barnacle wins in direct one-on-one -on -one competition with the little barnacle, okay? But there's a catch to that, which we'll see in a second. Let's see what Connell observed in the type. Here's a cool picture that shows a perfect little, um, you know, kind of description of what's going on, right? We had to define two new words here, fundamental niche and realized niche, okay? So in this case, niche refers to a place to live. And a place to live is a niche because one, it's an activity, living at a place, living at point A is an activity, 
And number two, there is something to be gained, space, right? If you live at that farm, you get that space that is available to you, okay? So the fundamental niche is what is possible. The realized niche is what happens, okay? So for you guys, your fundamental grade in this class, your theoretical grade is 100%, right? But your realized grade or your actual grade is whatever you want okay? So kind of like that, right? This is what is possible and this is what actually is observed in nature, what actually happens, okay? Just because this is what actually happens does not mean that is the potential, okay? The potential may be way greater, but we do not see that it's kind of covered up by various forces. Okay, so what's going on over here? Notice how the little barnacle, in represented in whatever color that is, beige or something, can live all the way from the high tide line to the low tide line. The little, the bigger barnacle, the acorn barnacle, can live from the low tide line only up to here. So let's talk about something. What is the difference in their tolerance levels based off of that? Which one? The big barnacle. The big barnacle cannot handle desiccation as well as a little barnacle, right? It can handle desiccation up until this height, but no further, right? So based off their fundamental niches, we already have a disparity in their tolerance levels. Keep in mind, tolerance is the upper limit to your zonation capability, right? Okay, so the big barnacle cannot tolerate desiccation as much. Okay, second, notice how we do not see any of the small barnacles down here, right? They are only up here. Why is that, right? Notice the first thing we notice is the little barnacle can, in fact, live across the whole area, but it does not, and it's not his choice, unfortunately. It's not like, well, I can live in this whole area, but I'm going to choose to live in the hardest area. No, this is the easiest, right? Why doesn't just choose to live in the easiest one, right? Why does it go for the hardest? because it's not his choice. When the little barnacle tries to live down here, what do you think happens to it? The big barnacle is gonna outgrow. Yes, the acorn barnacle will outcompete the little barnacle at the lower levels, right? The big barnacle is like, well, we want the easier spot. We're gonna live here and we're gonna fight you for it and we always win, right? So the acorn barnacle ends up growing here, right? They will outcompete the little barnacle, the buckshot barnacle, at the lower levels, and therefore it'll completely be taken up by the acorn barnacle. Okay, so the consequence of the acorn barnacle taking up all this spot is that they get to realize their fundamental niche, right? Notice how their realized niche is equal to the fundamental niche because all the places that they can live, they can defend that space and live in the whole place, all right? All of the places that the little one can live, they cannot defend it, they can only live in the place that nobody else can live, right? So what ends up happening is the acorn barnacle lives in their spot down below, and it kind of relegates the buckshot barnacle to only live at the top, which is possible thanks to the fact that they are extremely resistant to desiccation. The buckshot barnacle is extremely resistant to desiccation, so they can live at the top, whereas the acorn barnacle cannot live there because they are not as tolerant. Okay, so now we get the um, little barnacles, the buckshot barnacles, living at the very top. Their realized niche is only a fraction of their fundamental possible capabilities. Okay, so we see zonation, right? What do I mean by observing zonation? I'm saying, when you guys look vertically on a tide pool, you see one animal here, it stops, and then we see a different animal. That's what zonation means, okay? That's what I mean when we say different zones, okay? There's some organism here, and there's a line, and then it stops, there's another organism there. Sometimes there's a little bit of overlap. Okay, so the buckshot barnacles only live at the top. All right, now here's the question, right? Um, do the little buckshot barnacles want to live at the very top? No, no 
right? They do not want to live at the very top. It is the hardest of all the space, but they are kind of forced to, right? So why do they choose to live there anyways? We have to review our definition of niche, right? So look at this. The top of the spray zone is a niche, right? It's a very difficult niche. But here's the thing. What is true about every niche is that if there's something to be gained and it can be done, then something will go do it, all right? So the little barnacle is like, okay, well, I can't live here because all of the acorn barnacles are taking it up, but it is still possible for me to live up there. It's gonna be a hard life for me, but nobody else is living there and there's free real estate. So the little buckshot barnacle goes to live at the top, right? It may be at the worst area, but it's free. It's free for the taking. So they're gonna rise up to the challenge and go take it, okay? Because if they don't take it, then that spot is gonna be empty and it's free space. Someone's gonna take it, right? <clears throat> okay, so all niches that can be done will be done as long as you have something to gain there. All right, so the little barnacles, they don't wanna live at the top, but they have to and they will do it because free space. Okay, so now, now that we know a lot about competition, we can fill in the second reason why organisms go into different zones. Different animals live in different zones because of not only tolerance levels, but because of competition with other species. Okay, that is our second reason why organisms uh, live in different zones, right? They partition themselves in different zones. So now that we understand competition, we can go revisit pain study to see what happens to the competition in there. Okay, so just a quick recap. Robert Payne took all the sea stars out of the tide pool. Muscles experienced prey release, and now muscle population has increased drastically. Right? Muscles are sessile organisms, so what do they do? They take up space and they compete for it, just uh, along with the other sessile organisms. Right, so let's revisit that and talk about the spatial competition observed there. Like I said, mussels are not the only sessile organisms in the type pool. There's tons of other sessile organisms, right? Barnacles, gooseneck barnacles, aggregating anemones, they are all sessile, they all take up space. All right, well, what if it's the case that mussels grow faster than the other sessile organisms, right? Like, it's, it's really interesting. Sessile organism is defined as an organism that stays in one place its whole life and it doesn't move. That's not entirely true. Sessile organisms do move and their mode of movement is not locomotion. Our mode of movement is locomotion, getting from point A to point B. Sessile organism mode of movement is growth. Do you guys see how growth is actually a way to move, right? Like when you grow taller, your head moves from here to here. Right? It's a mode of motion, right? But it's not locomotion in which you get from point A to point B. It's a different type of movement, right? So sessile organisms can move, and the way they do so is by growing, right? And so if the muscles grow faster than all of these guys, then they will move to these areas and crowd them out, all right? They'll smother and crowd them out. That's how they compete for space, push them off the space, right? Okay, so muscles do indeed grow faster than most of these, and after a while, you will see areas covered in these places, or in these organisms, displaced by muscles, right? Muscles will just grow on top of them, and you can't have the other organism anymore. So that's not good, right? All the different organisms, the sessile organisms, can no longer live there because the muscles will push them away. Right? So what do we get here, right? Let's take a look at this. The control plot looks like this, right? The control site, it has sea stars, mussels, and all the other sets of organisms. Whereas over here in his experimental plot, only mussels, right? And that's bad. That's because once the mussels experience a prey release, they crowded out all the other sets of organisms here. So what do you guys notice between the two? Which one has higher biodiversity? 
the control, the normal one, right? The one with the C stars has greater biodiversity than the one without the C stars, okay? So you notice how, like, he only did one thing and the biodiversity changed so much, right? What did he do? He just, um, how many predators? I mean, how many different species? Just one. He only took out one species and it caused such a drastic change in biodiversity. We see that? Changing only one species, right? So if that one species has such a power to, you know, regulate how much biodiversity it is, then there's something special about the sea star, right? The biodiversity with the sea star is high, and the biodiversity without the sea star is low because it caused the mussels to crowd everything out. So if the sea star is the sole thing responsible for all of the biodiversity, then basically we can say the existence of the sea star allows biodiversity to exist, whereas if the sea star does not exist, then the biodiversity does not exist. All right? Such an organism is known as a keystone species. It is the type of organism that holds the whole ecosystem together, right? Because that's what a keystone does. Do you guys, have you guys heard of a keystone before? All right, what is the keystone used in? What is it used in? It's used in architecture, right? When you build an arch. Okay, so let's, let's try to build an arch. If you want to build an arch, we first make some two columns, right? Okay, two columns are easy because you just stack these bricks on top of each other. Like this. Okay, and then I'm going to make one right here. By the time you get to the top and you kind of want to connect the arch together, then you're going to have to put some like so, kind of like sideways angled ones right there. Okay, this one seems to be okay, but once I put the next one on, what's going to happen if I put that one there? As soon as I put it there, it'll fall down, right? So that's not going to work. I'm going to put it there, I'm going to have some people hold it up, right? Okay, I'm going to have some like people hold it up right there, okay? And then if I put this one here, what's going to happen to that one? also fall, so I'm going to have to like build something to hold that one up, right? This is not going to be stable until you drop the final piece, which is known as the keystone, right? Once you put that one in, it'll distribute the forces on each side and it'll hold the whole arch up. When we take out the keystone, what happens to the arch? It'll fall apart, okay? So think of the arch as the ecosystem and the keystone keystone species right here, right? So in this case, we have one keystone species, the okra sea star, right? What is its niche? Controlling the population of mussels, right? Because if it does not do so, then the mussels will overpopulate and crowd out all the other sessile organisms, causing a great reduction in biodiversity, right? If you keep the sea stars around, they will eat enough mussels that the biodiversity of the sessile organism will still be intact. Does that make sense? So with the sea stars, we have a lot of biodiversity, and without, we lose the biodiversity. That is the function of a keystone species, right? If you're not a keystone species and we take it out, then what's going to happen to the biodiversity? If you're not a keystone species. No, no, no. no. If you're not a keystone species and you take it out, nothing's going to happen. Yeah, so it's the same, right? Because it doesn't matter so much. But if it is a keystone species and you take it out, then you will lose biodiversity, like you did here, okay? So that's the end result of Payne's study. He figured out that sea stars are keystone species and controlling the muscle population, so that allows for a great diversity of sessile organisms, okay? Does that sound good? <clears throat> okay, so keystone species. We will talk more about keystone species in a later lecture, but this is the first keystone species we're gonna mention. Okra sea star of the Western uh, United States intertidal zone. Right. By the way, what's that called again? The major pore. Good. Okay. Okay. So now let's continue and talk about sea stars in the um, in the tide pool. Right. Look at this picture. Right. We have um, clear zonation happening. Right. Is this clear zonation? Look down here. Only algae. Right. We got some brown algae here. This is some green algae, and then we have a line of sea stars. And then we have mussels. That's clear zonation, right? Different organisms at different heights across the tide pool. Okay. So why is that, right? Why are the sea stars crowding about the mussels? They're obviously trying to eat the mussels, right? But why don't they just go here where all the mussels are? There's more there. 
Why are they on the fringe where there's less muscles and they're all competing against each other? Why don't they just go there? All the muscles are over there. What do you think might be the case here? Who needs water? Who needs water? The sea stars. The sea stars need water. They are not as tolerant as whom? The muscles. So the muscles being more tolerant to desiccation can be higher up. These ones are safe, right, from the sea stars. The sea stars need water, they're not as tolerant to desiccation, so they can only go up to this high. They can't go up much higher. If they do, they may die during the low tide, right? So something interesting is happening here, right? The zonation over here is a result of one, the sea stars not going all the way to the top because a lack of tolerance to desiccation. We've already talked about tolerance as being an upper limit to zonation, right? Well, same question, but I can ask it, or similar question, but I can ask it on the opposite end. Why are there no muscles down here? What was that? The sea stars are amazing. Yeah, the sea stars will eat the muscles that go down here, right? Because you gotta think about it this way. Isn't this a better place for the muscles to live? Why is it better? more water, right? It's easier. However, the muscles are choosing to live in the difficult higher area that has less water, right? Why don't they live here? Because if they do so, the sea stars will eat them. Okay, so we see a lower bound controlled by predation, right? So to summarize this in words, right? Sea stars upper limit is based off their tolerance to desiccation. They cannot go too high because they are not as tolerant as the muscles are. At the same time, the muscles cannot go too far down because if they do, the sea stars will eat them. Right? That shows us that the third and final cause for zonation that we're gonna talk about is due to predation. So different animals live in different zones because of tolerance, competition, and predation, right? Keep in mind that predation and competition are lower limits. Does that, does that make sense? Like what a lower limit is, right? So for example, if you get eaten, then you can't live too far down. If you are not a strong competitor, like the buckshot barnacle, then you cannot live that far down. And tolerance is an upper limit. If you do not have the proper hardiness to desiccation, then you cannot live too high, okay? So we have three reasons, two lower limits and one upper limit right there. Okay, and that's it, right? This is the three reasons why uh, zonation patterns exist in the intertidal zone, right? And we were able to explain why the zonation patterns exist by examining the ecology, how the organisms interacted with each other predation, competition, and how the organisms interact with the environment with the amount of water available, okay? <clears throat> okay, so any questions on this? Everybody kind of got it, right? So zonation, when, when I say zonation, I'm talking about sticking to any of the four zones, right? What were the names of the four zones again? Subtitle, Subtitle. lower intertidal, upper intertidal and the spray zone right at the very top. Remember the difference, the only difference between the different zones is the amount of water. Okay? And the more water the easier, the less water the harder so you have to be more tolerant. Right? Okay, cool. So we're gonna end on this last thing. I just want to show you a um, personal thing about mine. So like I got this album on Facebook that has like literally all the California type of animals in it. So I just want to show it to you real quick because I'm pretty proud of it. Okay, so let's go look for it. Okay, so here's my typo album, right? Um, I don't know, it's pretty amazing in my opinion, but I've seen like almost every single animal out there um, in California, and this has like been years and years in the making. So it's pretty crazy. So sometimes I see some really incredible things like this one, for example. That's a polyorchis. It's a type of hydroid, right? 
So that's pretty crazy. Let me show you some other the crazy things I've seen. So yeah, these were at all different tide pools in California. So for example, most of these ones in this section were in Catalina. But as you guys will see, like, you know, we have all sorts of different pictures at different times that I went to in different tide pools. And then you see like a whole group of pictures that look like they're taken in the same place. So anyways, yeah, let me just go down to show you where some of the really crazy things that I found. Actually, I want to show you this. Hey, what what uh, what phylum and class is that one in? Uh, phylum Chordata? That's A. Yeah, that was a recent one. Okay. Oh yeah, this one. Okay, so this is something that I've been looking for for so long, right? It's a sunflower star, right? Now we saw the sunflower star eats abalones and all that stuff, right? But this was found like in Central California. It was pretty exciting. Um, let's see, probably the thing I'm most excited about is this, the chestnut cowrie, because it took me like years to find this. I don't know, I was, I was like crying when I found it. <laughs> yeah. It was, I don't know, it was, it was like magical. Like, cause I was at, I was at Catalina at the time and there were like four really good low tides during my six week duration there. And I was looking for it every time because while diving there, I found them. So the first three times I didn't find it, and on the last time I could possibly go, I actually found it. That's crazy. All right, this is pretty crazy, I think. This is the giant sea star, the Navi sea star. Um, I literally went to San Diego just to find it, and I found it, so I'm pretty happy. Um, okay, so this is another one, the red octopus. Um, I went all the way to Central California to look for it in Santa Cruz, and yeah, I found it, so I was pretty excited. Let's see. Um, this is another good one, Dungeness Crab. I was always hoping to find one. Man, does it show what? Oh, this is the best thing. Okay, this is the craziest thing I've ever found. Okay, do you guys remember what this is? Horn shark egg case. This is the closest I'll ever get to seeing a shark in a tide pool, right? It might as well be one because it was a lot, right? And I put it back in, so that's that was insane. Yeah. Okay, just a quick quiz. What what uh phylum is this in? Platyhelminthus. Good. How'd you figure that out? Because it says flatworm. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. Okay. All right, you guys. So that's my typo album. It's pretty sick. And yeah, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, this is um, one of the ones that I found on a recent class food trip, actually. So pretty amazing. Okay. All right. Um, so that's the end of the lecture. Uh, let's take a break for about 15, 20 minutes or so. We'll come back at 3.25. Thanks for letting me know about the... Didn't, it, it was only like 30 seconds off, so.